Praise be to our Lord. As you are seated, if you want to take your copy of His Word and turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and if you are using one of the black hardback Bibles that you'll see in the seat in front of you, which you're welcome to do, you'll find 2 Corinthians chapter 2 on page 264. 264. Both last week and this week, we've done something of just a little series on the love of God in hard conversations, and this week in church discipline, talking about how His love extends in our relationships together. And that's what we see as we're dropping into this portion of 2 Corinthians. As we unwind this paragraph, we see a lot about how God's love extends in the love His church shows to one another. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. It is written, Now if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote, that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we praise You. We praise Your Son and the Spirit. You are triune God who has worked and shown Your eternal love in the death of resurrection of Your Son and the saving effectual call Your Spirit brings us to Him. Father, we pray as Your love has been extended to us sovereignly in Your Son as we've sung Your praise and we've enjoyed even already communion with you through your word and with one another. Help us grasp how this extends not just in moments of worship and in wonderful song, but even in our lives together. Make us, Father, loving, humble, denying self and seeking the good of others, that the world might see your love in Christ through us. Keep us, Father, from the lies and the designs of the evil one. Make us ever wise and not ignorant of his schemes, and that we might live together, protected by you, walking in your word and testifying to your love. Help us now as we hear your word and even prepare our hearts for this table, remembering the walk and life you have called us to, as you have called us in Christ, who's given his life for us. We come to you now in his great and holy name. Amen. Amen. By the late 4th century, the emperor of the Roman Empire was a professing Christian, Theodosius the Great. And Theodosius actually moved his capital to Milan, what we call Italy now, to be near Ambrose. Ambrose was the bishop there. You may not have heard of Ambrose. He is well known in church history, at least for one thing, being instrumental in the conversion of Augustine to Christ, whom you may have heard of, one of the most significant early church fathers. But Ambrose wasn't always faithful to Augustine. He was also committed to love in church discipline, even when it meant the emperor of the entire empire. In 390, there was a protest in Thessalonica, a revolt of some kind, and Theodosius overreacted. He sent in the Roman army, and they ended up massacring thousands. It got out of hand. Thousands of people died. For this, Ambrose publicly excommunicated Theodosius, and he wrote to him a letter. This is part of it. He wrote to the Roman emperor, you are a man. You have sinned as a man. You must repent as a man. God alone can forgive you, and he forgives those who repent. I love you. I honor you from my heart. I pray for you. If you believe this, accept what I say. But if you do not believe it, forgive me for preferring God over you. 
because his sin as an emperor was so public, Ambrose told Theodosius that what repentance would mean for his sin is literally walking through the, through the streets and shouting his guilt and shouting his confession of sin to the public and then coming to the church and kneeling before the congregation and begging for forgiveness for acting in such an awful way as a professing Christian. This was Caesar. Caesars don't kneel to anyone. But Theodosius did it. He did it crying. And afterward, Theodosius the Great was known to say, the only real bishop I know is Ambrose. Because the most powerful man in the empire from Ambrose experienced real love. Last week, we started to think about real love, which we said must be love like God, like God loves. God defines all things as a creator. And in the Bible, the Bible says that God, the Lord, disciplines those he loves. That's Hebrews 12, verse 6. And actually, that chapter goes on to quote verses just from the chapter we read, Proverbs 3. God's love disciplines. God's love seeks to make us like him, to give us the greatest gift love can be, to be like God. And so disciplining God comes to make us like him, to correct and confront what is not consistent with him, and to change us into his image. And that's how Jesus taught us in the church how to love one another. In fact, in one of Jesus' first instructions to his disciples as the church, to be the church, was how they are to love each other through discipline. How they are to deal with one another's sins, their inconsistencies with saying they follow him, but living and saying things that are not consistent with that. So in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 18, especially verses 15 to 17, the Lord Jesus essentially lays out a fourfold pattern of how Christians are to love each other in discipline. The first is that Christians are to tell the truth to the one in sin. If you see your brother sinning, if he sins against you, you, you go to them. You go to them in order to gain your brother. But if that doesn't happen, there's a second step in the pattern. You're to take witnesses to encourage repentance. The circle of accountability, if you will, widens to include other Christians to encourage and plead with a sinning Christian to repent, to turn from their sin. The third step, if the person is not repentant, is to tell the whole congregation but to widen accountability to the whole church so the church can pray for and call the professing Christian to repent of their sin. And fourthly and finally, if the person still refuses to do that, they are to be removed from the congregation entirely. And Jesus said they're to be treated like Gentiles and tax collectors. That is to say, in his language, they're to be treated as not sincere followers of Christ, as not sincere Christians. And that's real love. That's love like God loves. God disciplines those he loves. And the godly is to stand out with holy love. And that's essentially what Paul is teaching Corinth right here in this paragraph. This paragraph is tightly wound, as you probably can tell even as we read it. But let me paint a little bit of the background here. If you look at verse 1 in chapter 2, the last time Paul had visited this church, he said it was a painful visit. Well, what made it painful is the church actually rebelled against the apostle. The apostle who evangelized, who started this church, who brought them to Christ, their father in Christ, they rebelled against them because some false teachers had come in, and the rest of the book explains how this had happened. But even though Corinth rebelled against Paul, Paul did not fail to love them. Look at, look at verse 4. He says he wrote to them. He wrote to them a letter we don't have. He wrote out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. Paul wrote a letter that he says in chapter 7 was a severe letter. He rebuked them. He confronted them in love to show them love, even though it cost him. Paul essentially fulfilled what we looked at last week, if you remember Leviticus 19, verses 17 to 19. That to love your neighbor as yourself is to reason frankly with your neighbor, to reprove your neighbor, to confront your neighbor when they are in sin. God's people don't move away from the guilty and move into gossip or slander or judgment or hatred. God's people in love move toward the guilty, just like God does. They move toward to change and to confront, to have hard conversations. And that's essentially what Paul did in writing in verse 4. He had a hard conversation. 
He wrote a severe letter, a reproving letter, one that he said cost him in affliction and anguish even to write. But it bore fruit, and Corinth is starting to turn now. But now Corinth has to act with that same love to the person who started the rebellion against him. And that's our paragraph here, verses 5 to 11. Corinth is to show real love through proper church discipline. And what we see in this text is that the Holy Spirit is telling us that accountability and discipline in the local church is one important way we experience and show the love of God. Accountability and discipline in the church is an experience and it's a demonstration and display of the real love of God. Real love being shown. And it even defeats, as we'll see in verse 11, the schemes of the devil and protects us from his wiles. And it's really so fitting as we gather around this table to consider this topic. For the love of Christ that made us one with God has made us, if we're in Christ, one with one another. And God has defined how we are to love one another with with holy love. Love that moves toward one another with sin, seeking to correcting and changing. And to give one another the greatest give we can give anyone is to help us be like our God to help us be holy like he is. We see here in this passage, discipline as an act of love. What I want to do is essentially ask the question, who is being loved in church discipline? And we'll see in this text five answers. There's essentially five parties or groups that are being loved in church discipline. We'll see the redeemed are being loved, God's people. The rebellious in sin are being loved. The repentant are being loved. Our Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, is being loved, and also the rest of the world. So we'll just stick with ours this evening and look at five parties that are being loved in church discipline. Well, let's look at first five, verse 5. Discipline loves the redeemed. It loves God's people, Christians, the redeemed in Christ. At the root of Paul's painful visit was a single person. And we see him mentioning him in verse 5 as anyone who's caused pain. Verse 6, such a one. And then twice, verse 7 and verse 8, he refers to it as him. This guy, we don't know, who is likely the one who led the rebellion against Paul, probably influenced by false teachers. But what's important to note is Paul does not deal with this as merely a personal matter, though undoubtedly it was very personal. Look, the pain, he says, in verse 5, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure to all of you, to the whole congregation was pain. The pain was congregational. All the church was divided and impacted. Paul here is assuming in verse 5 our essential identity as a church, that since we are really joined to Christ, we are really joined to one another. We are bonded together. What he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, is you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. You're members of one another. You belong to each other in the same spiritual family because you belong to the same Lord. So your lives impact one another and the consequences of your actions have ripple effects into one another's lives, like being part of the same body. And so, if there is sin in one segment of a congregation, even in just one individual, and if that sin is left unaddressed or unheeded biblically, then it's not just that that person is pained or the one offended is pained. An entire congregation is hurt and divided and pained. Very sadly, I know of more than one situation where a spouse committed adultery and abandoned their marriage for another person in the same congregation, and the church corporately did nothing. Without question, the abandoned spouse was hurt. That goes without saying. But who else is hurt there? Everyone. The whole church. Because now the church is divided without shepherding as to who to side with in this broken marriage. And undoubtedly, immature Christians are going to pick the wrong side, if you will. And the church also now, those in the church who have struggling marriages and are trying to fight, they now have a a wicked example, a faithless example of how to deal with their difficulties in their marriage. 
And then all the Christians, married or not, are essentially being taught and displayed that when obedience gets hard, obedience is just unnecessary. All the redeemed are affected by sin in a congregation. So discipline loves all the redeemed because it consistently teaches how we trust Christ, what it means to follow him, and what that looks like, and disciples everyone who's a part of the church. Discipline first loves the entire congregation, loves the redeemed. Secondly, discipline loves the rebellious, verse 6. Discipline loves the rebellious. We see at first many were siding with this rebel, but when Paul sent this loving rebuke he refers to in verse 4, we see in verse 6 he re- refer to the majority that respond rightly. They respond with punishment. Now, now that phrase, that word translated punishment means censure or rebuke. You find it used elsewhere in the New Testament in Luke chapter 17, verse 3, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him or or punish him. So this is not corporal punishment, to be very clear. This is rebuke. This is a seek to persuade him, to tell him his sin. And if we look elsewhere in the context, even just by the phrase majority in verse 6, and the use of the word we'll explain in a moment in verse 8, reaffirm, we're talking here about a public action. We're talking about a church gathering, taking a vote. We know there was likely a vote because there's a majority. That means there was a minority who dissented. There's a public vote to remove this individual as a a Gentile and tax collector, as an unrepentant rebel, not walking faithfully with Christ. Now to our ears, when we hear things about like churches getting together, members meetings, voting to put someone out, it does not sound like love to us because of how we've been discipled by the world as to what to think about love. But let's just consider the other alternatives the congregation could go down and and maybe even think of the ones that we looked at last week in Leviticus 19. The congregation could gossip and slander about him behind his back. Did you see what he did to the Apostle Paul? But of course, when he walks by on Sunday, they just plaster those smiles on. And, and let him go on. They could harbor hatred and seek revenge. Maybe if they mistreat him enough, he'll just go away, this troublemaker, get him out of here. Or the church could just be indifferent. It's not my problem. I don't, I don't know him. He's not in my small group. And just let him believe that his actions are acceptable, that leading rebellion in the church is acceptable for a Christian until he stands in judgment before Christ. And it's too late. Now, when we set those other options alongside the path of discipline, which path is love? The option to to not discipline isn't love. It's selfishness. It's not wanting, verse 4, to endure the affliction and anguish that comes when you have to have hard conversations. When you have to reprove and confront, it's hard. But love does what's hard because love cares more about someone else than about enduring hardship. Love does what is best for someone else. The path that does what's easy for ourselves and is indifferent to others is the path of hatred. So the path of discipline here is the path of loving the rebel. Church discipline really is a way that a congregation corporately denies themselves and follows Christ. Denies what they would prefer to do and prefer not to do, and puts that aside and says, no, we're going to trust Christ, and we are going to love this individual. We want to love them as God has loved us. We want to love the rebel, and we want to point them to repentance. And that brings us to the third group that is loved by discipline, and we see in verses 7 and 8. Discipline loves the repentant, the repentant, those who are repenting. Oftentimes, people resist church discipline because they think it makes sinners feel unwelcome. So let's be very, very clear at the outset. The church is only for sinners. If you are not a sinner, you are not welcome here. Please leave. If you are a sinner, so glad you're here. We are all too. Only for sinners. The church is only ever for sinners. And to be fair, that's really the only option we have on the earth. It's sinners. But the church is only for one type of sinner, only one type. It's those who confess that they are sinners, 
and confess their sins and seek the forgiveness that God gives and assures us in Christ and seeks the grace of God in Christ to turn from their sin, however hard, however difficult, however slow, to turn from their sin in repentance. In other words, the church is only for sinners, absolutely. But the church is only for sinners trusting Christ and turning from sin. It's important to say, friend, if you're here and not a Christian, we are sinners too. We who are Christians. We're all sinners. And it's important to say too that Jesus Christ came for sinners. He said more than once in his ministry, I have not come to call the righteous because they don't exist. I've come to call sinners to repentance. Those who know that they failed the holiness of their God and creator and who know they need forgiveness. He has come to call them to turn from their sin and to trust in him. Christ came for sinners. Christ died to suffer on that cross outside the walls of Jerusalem, the sinner's judgment. And he rose again three days later to be a savior for guess who? Sinners. To be the sinner's savior. That he would save all who trust him. And he, would sa- and he does save all who believe in him. If you're a sinner, you have hope in trusting Jesus Christ. He rescues sinners from the judgment that you deserve. That's why he died. That's why he rose again. That's what he's doing now, standing at the right hand of God, is offering forgiveness for sinners who trust him. And that's what we mean when we talk about faith. Faith is relying and trusting in Jesus Christ. It's turning from sin. And faith means trusting Christ and turning from sin your whole life. You see, repentance and belief, it's not a one-and-done deal. It's not something you do one time, sign a card, walk an aisle, raise a hand. It's how Christians live. When we say living by faith, that's what we mean. We mean living by consciously always turning to Christ, trusting Him, and turning away from our sin repeatedly, daily, sometimes hourly, even by the moment. And discipline is God's gift to us when we forget that. When we forget that the Christian life is about confessing sin, turning from it, and trusting Christ who saves sinners. You see, church discipline is not to just uphold some some external moral code or just to keep everybody in line arbitrarily. Church discipline is God reminding us of the gospel, reminding us that sinners who turn from sin and trust in Christ are freely welcomed and forgiven in Him. Those who don't, aren't. The forgiveness belongs to repenting sinners, those trusting Him and who belong to Him. Those who confess their sin and turn from their sin are promised they have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. They're promised to have their sins cleansed. That's why Paul says at the end of verse 6, the punishment by the majority is enough. Because you notice at verse 7, he doesn't want him to be overwhelmed into the verse by excessive sorrow. That is to say, he, he's already been brought to sorrow in repenting. He's already had godly sorrow. Now, Paul's going to talk about this later in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. You may want to read that later where he talks about what godly sorrow looks like. But that godly sorrow has been produced in this man. He's sorrowed into repenting. And so what we see here very clearly is that Church discipline doesn't function to be vindictive or just to be mean. It's not punitive, barely so. Verse 7, it's to be restorative. Their, their goal is not to overwhelm him with excessive sorrow that so he's so preoccupied by guilt, he just loses all hope. And he sees no hope in sight and he thinks, well, he can't be forgiven. No, it's, it's redemptive. It's to restore. So what Paul in essence is saying is, is if, if there's true confession now, If there's true sorrow now, if he's truly repenting now, then you, verse 7, need to turn and forgive and comfort him. If he's really sorrowed for his sin, well, then that's enough. You need to turn now and forgive him because God forgives those who repent. You need to forgive him and you need to comfort him. And you could translate that word comfort as encourage. You need to give him strength with God's word. You need to remind him, maybe of some of those promises that we find in God's word. 
that remind us that all who confess their sin find God faithful and just to forgive them of their sin. So he needs to be encouraged with their word of God. He needs to be reminded of God's forgiveness. He needs to see your forgiveness. And then in verse 8, you need to reaffirm your love for him. I said I would explain that word reaffirm. That word reaffirm means ratify, like ratify a covenant. It refers to a formal, institutional, public motion. So what you have here is Paul again saying, like you gathered together to vote him out, you're now gathered going together and you're going to bring him back in. And you're going to show him publicly that he is reinstated in the church as a member and you are reaffirming his standing in Christ. Not because he's not a sinner now, he still is, like all of you, but he's a sinner who's repenting. He's a sinner who's confessing his sin, and he's turning to Christ. And so you're to bring him in. Essentially, church discipline is a dress rehearsal for Judgment Day. Our Lord is returning again one day, returning not to deal with sin, but he's returning to judge. And to be very clear, the Lord Jesus is not returning to judge sinners among non-sinners. The only option is sinners. He's returning to judge a world of sinners and to separate among those sinners those who trust him and have found forgiveness and belong to him by faith in Christ and those who haven't, who have turned from him, who have remained in rebellion against him and refuse to heed his word and to repent and to come to him for salvation. Jesus is returning to separate from the world those who trust him and those who don't. And church discipline is a dress rehearsal of that moment. If we call ourselves Christians, but then we live like Christ's commands don't matter, or like his grace isn't available to help us fight against sin and obey him, then our claim of being a Christian is insincere. And it may be dangerous, very dangerous for us in view of the coming judgment. And that's where church discipline fits. It comes in to teach us. Church discipline is a temporal judgment to bring temporal sorrow so that when we face eternal judgment, we don't fall into eternal suffering. It's a dress rehearsal of judgment day. And then church discipline teaches then everyone watching that repentance is right, that fighting against your sin is not a wasted life. It's not denying your your true self. It is becoming your true self in Christ. That the sacrifice for obedience, the denial to trust him and do what his word says is right and good and necessary. And we need one another to help each other on that path. And church discipline teaches all the repentant to keep repenting. Discipline rehearses in history what one day is going to play out in eternity. So we all keep holding tight to Christ and we all keep enduring in the gospel and we all stay looking to him. Discipline loves the repentance. Fourthly, discipline loves our redeemer. We see in verses nine and 10, discipline loves our redeemer. In all of this, Paul has just basically described the church following Jesus's instructions. His instructions in Matthew 18, And his instructions in places like Luke 17, verse 3, what I just quoted half of, where Jesus says, if your brother sins, rebuke him or punish him. And if he repents, forgive him. Basically laid out there and church discipline is filling that in. Rebuke your brother in sin and when he repents, forgive him. These are Jesus' instructions. Some of the first things that Jesus taught his church. So really, whether we discipline or not is whether is an issue of whether or not we love and trust Jesus. Do we believe him? Do we want to follow and trust his word? And you see in verse 9, Paul says, that's why I wrote. I wrote to you that I might test you and know whether, end of verse 9, you are obedient in everything. Paul says, I'm writing to this church that recently rebelled against him. So of course, Paul has good reason to test them and to question the validity of their faith given their recent past behavior. So he says, I'm writing to test you to see your genuineness. Are you real? Are you sincere? I want to see if you're obedient in everything. In other words, I want to see if you are loving and trusting Jesus. Are you repenting? Are you obeying him? 
In other words, he wrote to them, would they love and trust Jesus by punishing the one in sin? And now, of course, if he's been sorrowed to repentance, now the question is, would they love and trust Jesus? Put aside any thoughts of vengeance or hatred or bitterness, and now love him and turn to forgive, turn to reaffirm, and to bring him in. And notice in verse 10, to encourage them, Paul adds his own example. Even though Paul was the one most directly offended, once he knows the man's sorrow, what does he say in verse 10? Anyone you forgive, I forgive. Just so you know, I forgive him. And he goes on and says, indeed, what I've forgiven, if I've forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ. Now, Paul's writing this from Macedonia. He's not in Corinth, separated by a couple hundred miles. And he's writing separated, but joined to the same Lord. And so what he's saying, in essence, is I, I, we may be separate, separated physically, but we are united spiritually. And as we stand together in Christ, I want you to know that I am forgiving in Christ the one who offended. As an encouragement to them, you are to be eager to forgive as well. The one most directly offended, the Apostle Paul, is eager to forgive. And he does it, he says, for, for your sake, to teach you, to encourage you. I'm standing in Christ forgiving all who repent. And so you need to do the same. You need to turn and forgive and comfort him. As Paul trusts the Lord and forgives the one who pained him, he's arguing for Corinth, you need to trust him and forgive. And that's why I'm writing to test you in this. In other words, verses 9 and 10 end up something like a question for Corinth. Will they trust the Lord and do what is right? Will they trust him and bring someone in in forgiveness exercising church discipline properly? Will they show love biblically in a godly way? When a professing Christian considers what church they should join, many things are usually considered. Some things are very wise to think about. Some things, we'll just say, are less wise. But do you know what should almost always be first in the wise category? right alongside when we consider whether or not a church believes and preaches the gospel according to God's word, it's whether or not they practice church discipline. It's about whether we actually love Christ. You see, we can say we love Jesus all we want. We can hang banners out to all around us saying Jesus is everything, but if we avoid church discipline and loving one another, the way Jesus taught us to love? Is he really everything? No. Verse 9, we would fail the test. It's really very simple. If we won't trust the Lord when it's hard and unpleasant, and the things he asks us to do goes against ways that we've been taught by our culture and expectations, have we really trusted him? Have we really denied ourselves and said, I'm following Christ, come what may? Over a century ago, Baptist theologian John Dagg wrote this, when discipline leaves a church, Christ leaves with it. Dagg was right. When discipline leaves a church, Christ has gone with it. Discipline is one important proof of whether or not we love our Savior, whether we love our Lord and King, or whether we just find him convenient for some things. Discipline is about loving our Redeemer, our Lord, trusting our King. Finally, implied by verse 11, discipline loves the rest of the world. Discipline loves the rest of the world. Now, the world is supposed to see love from us, Christians, IBC. The world is supposed to look at us as a congregation and have an understanding somewhat of what God's love looks like. That's one of the reasons we're still here. We gather together so that people will know how God loves. Jesus said this repeatedly in his word. One important place would be John 13, 35. By this, all people will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. But the world is to look at you, Christians, as you live together as a church, and they're to see and understand some reflection, some visible representation of the love of God. 
And what the world is supposed to see is God's love. But our enemy, the devil, that liar and murderer, he works to ensure that the world doesn't. That's what his goal is. Verse 11, his goal is to outwit. You could translate that exploit or take advantage. His goal is to take advantage of situations. And what better situation to take advantage of than sin in a church? The devil wants to exploit these situations. You could see many ways that he could do so. Back up in verse 6, if Corinth had refused to punish and refused to deal with sin, well, then what could the world say to the church? Well, you're all hypocrites. You talk about being redeemed in Christ and walking in love and being changed to be like him, but you guys have people sin and you don't do anything. Hypocrites. Or Satan could, conversely, he could exploit their opportunity here where Paul's writing now if they refuse to forgive. And then what could the world say to the church? You guys are all a bunch of hypocrites. You say you believe in forgiveness and God's grace, but when someone wrongs you and they turn from it, you don't welcome them back. Hypocrisy. And whether the church would be tolerating unrepentant sin or refusing to forgive those who repent, the devil doesn't care. What he wants is to exploit and take advantage of the church so that the church undermines the gospel. That the church doesn't show the love of God rightly and accurately to the world. Satan does not want the truth of God's love to get out. He does not want the hope of the gospel to go to our world. Satan wants churches that tolerate sin, that hold grudges, that backbite, that slander, and display all manner of hatred and mistreatment to the world so that the world could have God's love hidden from it. It's because he's a liar and he's a murderer and he wants the church to lie about God's love in Christ so that the world perishes and they don't hear about the wonderful hope we have by turning for forgiveness in Christ. And so part of the action of church discipline is simply loving the world, refusing the schemes of the devil, refusing his temptations and his designs, and seeking instead to be steadfast to give an accurate picture of love to the world. Now don't misunderstand, when I say discipline loves the world, the world's going to thank the church for doing discipline. No, they're not going to stand up and applaud but even if they hurl accusation and slander at the church, they're still watching. They're always watching. You remember how Peter reminds us of this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. When they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. When they speak against you, they may see your good deeds. Even when they're speaking, they're always seeing, and they're always watching. And even when they may give accusations or slander or rebuffs, even against church discipline, they're watching. They're watching and looking. And if they were able, as it were, to peer into the windows of the church in Corinth, what would they be seeing? Well, they would see initially a church torn in two by this rebellion. But then they would see, verse 4, an apostle and a great leader not giving up on a church. And in the midst of affliction and anguish, correcting them in love. And then they would see, verse 6, they would see the church dealing with sin and loving the rebel who wouldn't repent by putting him out and punishing him, rebuking him. And then they would see when that rebel turns in repentance, seeks forgiveness again in Christ to walk after him, they would see him, verse 8, reaffirming their love for him, forgiving him, encouraging him in the forgiveness he has in Christ and from them. And if the world were able, as it were, to look into window and to see all of this, they would see something unnatural. The world doesn't love this way. And it would be undeniably real. It would be real love. And they would have to at least wonder and ask about the reality of God's grace in Christ. Maybe even to say like Theodosius, these are real Christians here. There's something about that. Our world already knows about indifference and hatred and abandonment and slander. Our world is awash in it. Our world is waiting to see real love. 
God's love, love that only comes from him. And our calling, beloved, part of our commission as a congregation is to be here and to show it and to display it and to give a visible representation of God's love in Christ. God's wisdom is not the wisdom of our world. Our world were to, w- would say to have influence, to get as many people around us as possible, just lower your standards and don't give anyone accountable for anything. But God says, you only let the repentant in and those who fail to repent, you put out until they repent and turn again. And God says it because it's real love. It's like him. And when we obey our Lord in the acts of church discipline, and we love through hard conversations and confrontations and correction, we're reminding one another and showing the real gospel. We remember what really happened at the cross, that Christ really died for sin. We remember what we gather around this table to remember that the cross really changed everything to forgive us of our sins by trusting our Savior and to bring us into union with Him and not just with Him, but because of that with everyone who belongs to Him. We belong to everyone else. This is what Paul also wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Beginning in verse 15, he wrote this, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. At the cross, if you trust in Christ, you were really forgiven, and all your sins were are really paid for by the blood of Christ. And if you trust in Christ because of his death and resurrection, you are really joined to one another in him. The cords of love that has bound us to God through the forgiveness in Christ has tied us also to one another in him. And because we partake of one body and one bread, we are members of one another. And so we live in real love together, a love that never forgets that gospel and wants that gospel always to be front and center in front of all of us and to the whole world. And so we love one another, even in confrontation, even in hard conversations and in church discipline. And we remind one another of the real love of God in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we pray we would never forget the transformation and change of the cross. We pray that you would help us remember always the hope of the gospel and even to deal with one another in it as you've made us one with yourself in Christ. We thank you, our God. We thank you for your love and grace and church discipline that even as we walk together in these ways, we lovingly remind one another of what is true, that those who refuse to repent have judgment facing them, but those who turn have your acceptance and forgiveness. Father, never let us grow tired or be afraid of standing on these truths and seeking to love one another and others in them. Help us, Father, we pray, to be a window into your love as a congregation. Forgive us in the so many ways that we fail to do this constantly. Help us to grow more in obedience to you, being faithful to you and to one another in love and loving each other in these ways. We ask this, Father, because we love you and we love those around us and we want them to know you as well. Help us, Father, in Christ's name, amen.
the table that we gather around is prepared for those who are forgiven by faith in Jesus Christ. This is a gift that our God has given us as his church to encourage our faith and our walk with him. If you're not a Christian this evening, we encourage you to take this time to consider the offer of forgiveness that Jesus is holding out to you right now that you've even heard on the basis of his word. We encourage you to put your hope in him. You may not share in the bread and cup with us this evening, but you may come to Jesus tonight, and you may know his forgiveness. As this display of his love and his body broken and on the cross and his blood shed is passed around, consider his offer to you and trust him. Put your hope in him. And if you want to talk with someone about that, you can just look for a member next to you or you can come up to speak to any one of us up here and we would love nothing more than to talk to you more about what it means to put your hope in Christ. And beloved, as we come in Christ to this table, we come not as the perfect, we come as those who have been perfected by Christ. We come as sinners who are turning from our sin and trusting in Christ and walking after him by the power of his spirit to repent of our sins and be conformed to his image. In this table, our Lord is bringing us, you and I, assurance that our sins are forgiven, that our place with him is secure, our hope for eternal life is ours, and life now before him is guaranteed by his spirit. The Lord wants us to know and to remember and to walk boldly in these truths. That's why he's called us to his table. We're going to begin now also, and Pastor Paul is going to lead us in prayer as we prepare our hearts to receive the elements. Let's pray together. Oh, our Father in heaven, as we take the bread once again, as we take the cup in our hands, we remember. We remember Jesus the Christ who is the bread of life, who came down from heaven that we might have life in him. We remember and see in the bread our true and better Adam come to save the lost, as we sang earlier. In the bread, oh, may we tonight see the great cost of our redemption, the blood that was shed for us. And that he who knew no sin, who enjoyed the glories of heaven, came to this dusty, sin-cursed world and became sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God in him. Oh, what a great love. What a great love behind such a great salvation. As we take this bread May we see beyond the element. May we, when we take the cup, may we see beyond the cup to see your great love for the world. May we see the great love of Christ as he accomplished our redemption. And may we see the sweet, gentle love of the Spirit who took us, who were alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, happy to be going to hell because we did not want Jesus to reign over us. But now, because of your great love and because of his great desire to make much of Christ, opened our eyes to see the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And bring us into fellowship with you and to bring us peace with you and to bring us in fellowship with one another and so together tonight we take the bread and we take this cup and we remember the one who is the one who was and the one who is to come we remember christ amen our brothers are now going to come and distribute the bread when you receive the bread, please hold it, and we will partake together. And as our brothers are distributing, if you will take the blue hardback, the Trinity hymnal, in the seats in front of you, and turn to number 192, hymn 192, 
stricken, smitten, and afflicted. A wonderful hymn. Let's sing together. ever think of your sin lightly, look at the cross. Ye who think of Simba lightly, nor suppose the evil great, here you view its nature rightly, here your guilt is estimate. Mark the sacrifice appointed, God's Son. But then notice the next verse, but there when we're weeping and seeing the guilt of our sin, hear the refuge of the lost. Lamb of God for sinners wounded, sacrifice to cancel guilt. This is what our Lord has called us to the table to be renewed and remember. And we are told in his word that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And after he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. Father, your son has not only offered his body on the cross once for all for our forgiveness, but even now he nourishes us more as we commune with you in faith at this table. Father, grant us the grace to seek and know and believe more of your son's love 
and his life for us. It is by faith that we enjoy him. Our Lord Christ, the bread of heaven, who gives us life, life to no longer live for ourselves, but to live for him, to live lives that are holy and loving and humble and faithful. We have eternal life in your Son, Father. We only pray that we might so live that the fruit of our lives will indeed continue into eternity. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We want to take now the cup, and as the brothers distribute the cup, if you will take the coil-bound songbook, Emmanuel Praise, and turn to page 86, the Lamb of God. Page 86. And again, please hold the cup until we've all been distributed. It is also recorded for us in God's word. In the same way also after supper, the Lord Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Father, we rejoice that you have made us partakers of the new and eternal covenant, your covenant of grace, and so you are our Father eternally. You, Father, because of the shed blood of your Son, will not charge our sins to us. But as your forgiven and beloved children, even the heirs of your Son's kingdom, you will provide all things necessary for our life and for eternity. Father, as we celebrate your Son at this table, may you renew our strength in faith 
May we announce with greater boldness your son's greatness and his death and resurrection. May we have a greater zeal in our lives for good works and love for one another. And we ask only that you would be glorified in our lives with greater confidence and clarity. We ask things, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. It's also written, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And the Bible ends in the book of Revelation saying that he who testifies to these things, the Lord Jesus says, I am coming quickly. And the church replies, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. We've had a wonderful day today. Christ reigns over all, we saw this morning. And Christ has cared for us so much, he's given us a church to love us and to care for us even when we stray. And so we want to round out our day together by singing, All I Have is Christ. Take your Emmanuel praise and turn to page 18. And let's sing together the source and our Savior, Christ. Now we're going to keep experiencing the love that God has given us in His Son Jesus by extending our fellowship with a time of a simple meal and being together. 
And again, just reiterating what Rick said as we began our service. If you're here visiting with us this evening, you're more than welcome to join us. Please, please join and stick around. We'd love to get to know you more, and we are sure open and want to be open to you and helping us, helping you get to know us as well. But we also pray as we conclude our service that until we gather again, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed.